Hi, Misha here, and uh, just did a video on the Feisler FI-103, a.k.a. the V-1, Vengeance Weapon 1, Germany's cruise missile in World War II. And so with that in mind, it's time to look at the Aggregate 4, A4, or as it was known for propaganda reasons, the V2. Uh, this was the first really successful rocket in the world, I mean military, so long-range ballistic missile. It was a very advanced weapon of war in 1944-1945, but it did have shortcomings. On the other hand, this was mankind's first spacecraft. This was the first artificial object to be launched by man that would uh, cross the boundary into space. And more importantly, it directly led to the American and Soviet space programs. So on the table, I've got a couple of models here for you. This is a V1, excuse me, V2, on its trailer, being pulled by a half-track. Here is the other part of the assembly, being pulled by another half-track. It carries the stand that it would be erected on. And then once those two were at the launch site, it would be put up like this. Yeah, he's there. <laughs> Has an inspection ladder. It erects upright. These are actually for leveling. So it was a mobile launch system, which was one of its greatest assets. All of these are 172 scale from Precision Model Art. It's one I don't really have any others of, but I wanted a V2 set, and they made it. The rockets themselves are plastic with removable panels, and the trailers and whatnot are mostly die-cast metal. So as always, let's go ahead and get on into the history of the V2. Well, let's see if this will be as brief as my, quote, brief history development of the V1. And of course, the V2 all begins with Werner or Werner von Braun. In the 1920s, as a young man, he, he dreamed of rocketry. It was just his literal overriding obsession. And um, in 1930, he started to really study this engineering technical at the Berlin Technical University. We'll call it Berlin Tech. <laughs> so pre-Nazis, he was already studying rocketry. And, uh, of course, the Nazis come in in 1933, and by this point, Von Braun is preparing for his Ph.D., working on his dissertation and whatnot. He's interested in liquid fuel rockets at this time. And in 1934, he actually, along with a small team, is able to launch two small, early, primitive, liquid-fueled rockets. And this caught the attention of Walter Dornberger, who basically took him under his wing, took him on board with the young Nazi party, was able to get von Braun funding from the Ordnance Department, 
kind of get his work looked at, and so this really helped progress. Now, Dornberger had actually been working on solid fuel rockets, so he was no stranger, just a different, uh, different style, different variation. This began the aggregate program, A, of course, beginning with A1. A1 and A2 were small scales. A3 was tested out in 1936, but it had some problems. Nevertheless, by 1937, von Braun outlined the basic specs for the A4. And this was to be the first true large-scale rocket. But at this time, they did not have the technology to uh, implement it. It was just, you know, scaling it up. To that end, there was the A5, which was an intermediate step using the A3's engine. And this would be tested in 1938. And then the government would give additional funding and go-ahead for the development of the A4. And this would lead to the last weekend in September of 1939. Now this is right after the invasion of Poland, or early successes. This is when the V1 was getting very little traction. But the A4... It was seen as a potentially offensive weapon, not just defensive, because of its range and technology. And it was that kind of high-tech thing that the Nazis were always enamored with. So during a conference at Pinamunda, essentially plans were developed, funding unlocked, a lot of political schmoozing happened. I think it was called the Day of Enlightenment or the Day of Wisdom in German, but uh, this is really what solidified the missiles or the rockets' future and really got von Braun a big team funding, and of course now we're on a wartime footing as well. And really by 1941... The research team at Pinamunda had the basics of what they needed to go forward with the A4. It was kind of a long road because they're really hitting the cutting edge of tech. But uh, Von Braun was the right man for the job. He was, yes, a good inventor, a good scientist. But he was equally a good administrator, organizer, structurer, team leader. He knew how to delegate. He knew how to motivate people. And it was sincere because this was his thing. He wanted this to work come hell or high water. So he was myopic in its pursuit. But he was not interested in his A4 primarily for its military application. No, he had dreamed of space flight since the inception, being a fan of Jules Verne. It's also worth pointing out before this became a classified program, and the Nazis really took it under their full control, that Robert Goddard in America was consulted and even contacted and his research used. So he was an early kind of a hero of von Braun. So there's some connective tissue there as well. And I don't want to make it seem like he was the only one working on rockets in the 1930s. He certainly wasn't. There were even pro you know, programs in Soviet Russia. But the A4, with Nazi backing, just really jumped ahead of everything else. So what exactly did they uh, come up with? So basically, what they had to develop and had ready to go, more or less, was the full-scale liquid rocket engine. They had to work on a guidance system. They had to design the body for aerodynamics. 
and they had to design uh, controls to, you know, maneuver it, rudders and the like. In 1941, Hitler wasn't super impressed. Actually, he was kind of clairvoyant. Uh, you won't hear me say Hitler had the right idea, but I'll explain what I mean later on. He saw it as basically a long-range artillery shell that was extremely expensive to develop, to produce, everything. Using up resources. But he didn't cancel the project. So it went forward. The systems were developed. And the very first prototype flew on October 3rd, 1942. Making this very historic. On its first flight, the A-4 reached an altitude of 52 miles. And... Uh, Afterwards, Dornberger made a speech, and interestingly, it didn't focus on the military. It, he actually said this was an exciting time, a new time, and space flight opening in the door. So you kind of see the, the excitement here isn't necessarily for warlike intentions. But of course, that's what they had to sell it as, to get things going. After this first successful test flight and a couple of others, Hitler again was shown the A4, and now he kind of got excited. Now keep in mind, by late 1942, he's been receiving some bad news, some setbacks. As I've said in multiple videos, Germany is now on a defensive front, or at least quickly getting there. So this was some good news. So the infection of von Braun and Dornberger was kind of infectious. The excitement of, well, you know what I mean. <laughs> Still getting over my flu, guys. Apologies. So, right before Christmas in December of 1942, Hitler signed a production order. So, facilities were getting set up in 1943. And, they basically were encountering problems, but they were overcoming them. But then Von Braun, kind of the silver tongue person that he was, told a Nazi commission from the government in September of 43 that, oh yeah, we're, we're ready to go, We've, we worked out everything. We were practically ready to start cranking these out. Meanwhile, they kept discovering issues and mostly fixing them and discovering more and mostly fixing them. By March of 1944, they had had 26 successful A4 launches. However, only four hit the target zone. And the problem was, a lot of them were breaking up in flight. Some of them had guidance or other issues from the rocket engine. So when well, they were able to get these off the ground, yeah, they weren't always doing much after that. Nevertheless, it was becoming available. So what do we have? Well, the rocket itself is about Twenty-seven and a half thousand pounds. It's forty-six feet long. The cylindrical body has a diameter of about five and a half feet, and it has a wingspan of a little under twelve feet with the fins. It carries a thousand kilogram warhead so very 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 similar to that of the V1 which itself is coming online around the same time but it is more accurate than a V1 it can hit a target within about a six to eight mile circle, 
diameter circle. But really where its advantage is just how it does it. When shot at a target, this would hit a maximum altitude of around 55 miles. Although to be fair, when just shot up vertically, it could easily go over 100 miles. It would be powered up by its rocket engines, which would cut off, it would tip over, it would go ballistic, and it would hit its target at nearly 3,600 miles per hour at its max speed and impacting the target at over 2,000 miles per hour. Keep in mind, this is an era when 500 miles for a plane is fast. So we're talking four to seven times the speed of aircraft and coming out of the sky from way higher than anything can fly at that time. Making it essentially invulnerable. And one of the downfalls of the V-1, oh, I didn't mention, it also has more range than a V-1, at least 200 miles, whereas a V-1 is about 150. But the V-1 could be air-launched, which meant the aircraft was vulnerable, or it could be launched from fixed sites using ramps, but it really wasn't a mobile launch thing, and that's where this little setup comes in here. This is a KFZ-8 half-track for just standard, you know, anything kind of large scale could uh, carry these. As you see, it's, it's um, on its trailer. It would be carried to a site where another vehicle wouldn't have to be as big as this one. I just happen to have a spare one of these to have. We carry a much smaller for what's called the Bren stand. It would uh, slide this off its trailer for the missile to be erected on. Say hi to the guys. <laughs> and then the other trailer would be backed up to it and erected on the stand. And it would remain there as its launch tower. Again, these are for leveling and stabilizing. It would be fueled up, inspected. That's why there's this ladder over here. Um, I just had a guy that has a little figure laying on his back and I thought it'd be funny to stick him out of the engines. Yeah, yeah. It would be have its target set and it would uh, it would be launched. So typically what they do, and they, they didn't really need much space, only a, only a couple of hundred feet square area to pull these out in the open at. It did not take them very long to set up. They could do it in under two hours usually and fire the missile and then retreat back, not giving allies any time at all. And of course, then they would uh, take the launch vehicle back. It was all reusable, the trailer and everything. And uh, usually hide them in forests or caves or, or whatnot. If nothing else, to at least put camouflage tarps over them. It's worth pointing out that the uh, carriers, the half-tracks that move these were extra armored in case there was an explosion of the rocket. And of course most all the tools and whatnot were kept on the trailer and various boxes and what have you.
So what about the uh, what about the services thing? Here is the uh, engine cover removed for inspection and refueling and on the model because it looks cool. Before we get into the war stuff, I will say that a V2, as it would soon to be known, for Vengeance Weapon 2, still A4 officially though, it's worth pointing out that while the V1 was considered an aircraft and thus under the auspices of the RLM, the Luftwaffe, the A4 program was under the auspices of the German army. Because it was considered, again, you know, Hitler wasn't wrong, kind of a long-range artillery shell. On June 20th, one of these reached its maximum altitude of a 108 and a half miles above the surface of Earth. By this point, they had corrected many of the issues, including the breakup. They started using a fiberglass shield to protect it in flight, as well as just making other changes. These um, would mostly be guided by a primitive analog computer that used two gyroscopes. But some would be guided by a beam, a radio control beam guided. About one out of five would be. Hitler didn't like this. He was afraid they could be uh, hijacked or disrupted. So most ended up being independent. When you went to the analog, you sacrificed a lot of pinpoint accuracy, making this a strategic weapon, not a tactical weapon. Well, as these were getting ready to go into the field, the scientists kept saying, well, you know, we really need more time. We can really make this a better thing. They, we haven't worked out all the issues, but they're flying. And, of course, it's 1944. D-Day occurs. And this basically gets taken over by the SS, the Waffen-SS. And then one of their generals, Hans Kammler, had this brilliant idea. Let's use slave labor, be it from political prisoners or prisoners of war. Let's source them from the Dora concentration camp, a particularly brutal camp, frankly. And so a site was set up under Pinamunda, known as the Middleburg site, to produce these. And they were produced underground to try to avoid Allied bombing. And then on August 29th, Hitler signed an order to put the V2 into use as soon as possible. Again, now the war is really not going well. We need some results after all these years. So, Operation Penguin begins, and the first attempt to launch V2s occurred on September 7th, when two were shot from mobile trailers at the city of Paris, recently being fought over with the Allies and whatnot, and now they're hits. They're both duds. But on the Next day, the 8th, one is shot at Paris and does hit, doing moderate damage. And two, after that success early in the day, are shot at England and hit London. And by October, much like with the V1, they've decided the two valid targets for the V2 are going to be London and Antwerp. 
They really had it out for Antwerp. And after two months of successful use, the Nazis officially announced to the world their new vengeance weapon on November 8th. Now the British, Churchill in particular, had been kind of trying to keep this hush-hushed. For obvious reasons, as you can think of him. But, you know, with the Nazi announcement, he has to admit. So, two days later, in a public address, he says that England has been under rocket attack. Just calling it rocket attack. He's trying to minimize panic. For, quote, a few weeks. Which is technically accurate, I guess. Eight is kind of a few. And the reason he was reluctant to tell the public was because the Germans really had something here. The Allies, they could defend against the V-1. Airplanes, barrage balloons, AA guns. But they had no way to really defend against the V-2. Or even hit its launch sites because of how quickly they could spring up and disappear. And even its production facilities are predominantly underground, making them a harder target. I'm not saying impossible, but a harder target to hit. So, yeah. Speaking of launch sites, I think I said a bit ago that uh, it just needed a couple hundred feet. It's actually, I just checked, it's under... It's like 23 feet by 23 feet squared is all they needed. A wide open area, just, um, you know, a couple of dozen feet wide to launch these. Which is any town square, or heck, any big backyard. Very, very little. I mean, they could shoot these from anywhere. And they had the longer range and the speed to do so. One of the first things the British did try was to jam the V2. So Hitler kind of called it there. But of course, since it wasn't being beam guided, this was ineffective. It was too fast for airplanes. And the AA guns at the time did not have the proper tracking systems and whatnot to uh, shoot it down. It was estimated that they would have to shoot so many shells up that this, this, the shells coming down would do more damage than the V2s themselves. And of course barrage balloons were completely ineffective. They were ineffective enough against the V1, but yeah, against the V2, pointless. The largest, most uh, costly hit on England came on November 25th, right before 12.30 in the afternoon, when a V-2 hit a Woolworths. About 160 were killed, with over 100 more injured. The only real defense that the British had that worked was espionage, misdirection. They were able to successfully kind of fooled the Germans into thinking they were overshooting their target, therefore the next V2 attacks would be overshot, landing in Kent, a rural area, where they did pretty little damage. But honestly, there just, there just wasn't any, um, any way to defend against them. And as hard hit as London might have been between these and the V1s, Antwerp received even more of a blunt. In December, it had the largest death toll because of a V2 strike when one hit a cinema. It killed over 550 and injured nearly 300, meaning that over 850 souls were affected. The Germans even tried using the V-2 tactically in March as the Allies 
got closer and closer to Berlin, but it was ineffective. The, they just they didn't have the accuracy. On the other hand, the only time a launch vehicle was successfully destroyed was just kind of by happen chance on January 1st during Operation Bodenplatt when an Allied fighter just happened to see one of these out in the open and strafed it and destroyed it. This is the only confirmed time a V-2 launch facility was destroyed, although there are rumors of a couple of others maybe being damaged or destroyed, but no confirmation. The final V-2 attacks came on March 27th, which afterwards they just were no longer able to, to, to field these. They produced just under 6,050, successfully launching 3,225. In London, roughly 2,750 civilians would be killed, with a bit over 6,500 injured. Thing uh, because of V2s. Antwerp, it was a little less devastating with about a thousand seven hundred and fifty killed and about four thousand five hundred injured. Property was destroyed, and this had the ability, unlike the V1, to hit hard and kind of bury itself before finally exploding. It too used an electric detonator with a mechanical backup. Fuel was a mix of ethanol and water with liquid oxygen as an oxidizer called A stuff and B stuff. So by April of 1945 the Allies were claiming more and more German territory, including the V-2 facilities. It has to be said that more people died building these, many from the concentration camps, than actually were killed by them. And according to Freeman Dyson, The German use of the V-2 was actually much to the Allies' advantage. He estimated that each one of these, so over 6,000, was built at the cost of an advanced fighter, like a Falkwolf or a 262 or what have you. So Germany shorted themselves 6,000 fighters. Of course, it took time and resources away and wasn't all that effective. And fortunately, while it did affect the lives of a lot of civilians, it had extremely little military impact. These were not hitting military targets. These were terror weapons, vengeance weapons. So while politically and for propaganda, they were perhaps very devastating, they actually didn't do a damn against the Allies, military forces. Except mean they had fewer fighters to contend with, maybe. So. Yeah, probably not the best step they took, honestly. I mean, at least for, for them, for us it was. Especially when it came to after World War II. Really, Britain, America, France, the USSR benefited from the Nazi research, and of course, America in particular, from von Braun himself. So let's, uh, let's leave wartime behind us and kind of talk about something a little optimistic before we wrap this video up. So yeah. Notice a similarity? <laughs> The uh, 
Mercury Redstone Rocket compared with the uh, V2. On the May 2nd, both Dornberger and Von Braun surrendered to the Allies, along with over 120 other scientists and engineers from Pinamunda and the V2 program. The Allies quickly carted up as much as they could. They obtained around a hundred V2 rockets or assemblies for V2 rockets plus many other parts, drawings, diagrams, fixtures, enough to fill 300 train cars. Then of course they would leave and the Soviets would be the ones to actually obtain the Pinamunda facilities themselves. They would get scientists as well, not as many, and of course lots of parts and material but they would get more of the machinery and whatnot. Later that year in October, the British had Operation Backfire, where with the assistance of uh, Germans, they assembled V2s and launched them for testing. They did this in northern Germany. This is actually what this particular model is a paint scheme from. That was some of the early testing. The U.S. would uh, send a lot of their material ultimately to White Sands, New Mexico and start launching their own V-2s. And in fact, the very first picture ever taken from space was on an American V-2 launch October 24th, 19... 46. Of course, America was in the best position because it wasn't devastated like the other nations. But that aside, by 1947, Russia was launching its own V-2s. This is when Sergei Koryev becomes, in, you know, kind of introduced to everything. And by 1948, they're working on their own clone or variation known as the R-1 which would lead into their own space program. I don't have a model of an R-1 or R-2. It's actually very hard to find Soviet models. But I have this here. This is actually from Mastercraft. It's of the Redstone rocket first seen in 1958. And it really is a V-2, but made two-stage. Now, the Redstone was suborbital. The Atlas, on the other hand, a larger, more powerful version, was, could get a American into full orbit. So, Alan Shepard would ride one of these. And... John Glenn would ride an atlas. And of course, Werner von Braun would be instrumental in the American space program and with NASA. He'd also be very well known in the town of Redstone. He lived for many years, and he was able to live to see his uh, his dream of space flight and even uh, men on the moon. And he was ready to even push it further to going to Mars, but politically that wasn't in the cards. He would uh, pass away from cancer. I remember, I think it was 1975, maybe it was 1978, but in the mid-late 70s. 
He's an interesting man. Almost amoral. I don't know. I don't want to get into that here. Certainly, people died because of him, because of his missile, also its construction from the concentration camp, labor force. But it wasn't like he wanted it. On the other hand, he didn't prevent it. He just wanted his rocket. He wanted space travel. And that was about all he thought about, frankly. That was just kind of his um, his genius, but also his uh, his failing. He was just very single-minded. Sometimes not really acknowledging people, which is funny considering what a good manager he was. Nevertheless, the V2, while it didn't really benefit. The Nazis, all that much, frankly, really did lead to the space program. And I would like to think, perhaps, gave a non-violent outlet to the Cold War. I mean, I often wondered, without the space program in the 1960s, if one of the other parties might not have tried to one-up the other one by more military means. This, of course, pushed science ahead by decades, computers... All kinds of stuff. And it's all because of the V2, the A4. Werner von Braun. And his interests that dated all the way back to the 1920s. I mean, that was his life's goal. So in that sense, he was very successful. And so, credit where credit is due. And with that said, I think I will wrap things up and get back to work. But yeah, so ever since I did the V1, I thought I gotta do the V2. I've actually had the uh, post-war backfire example for quite a long time. It's been meaning to do this one. You know how it goes. Anyway, hope you enjoyed this. If you have any questions or comments, please do post them below. And if you could, like, share, and subscribe. Yeah, boop. I do wish these were metal, but that's alright. Still neat. Still a good size. I do appreciate it, folks. And I will catch you very soon next time.